The ascent to power of Catherine I of Russia is probably the greatest rags to riches story of the 18th century, and one future generations of the Russian imperial family would take pains to conceal. She was the first Empress Regnant of Russia, the successor of one of its most celebrated and important Tsars, Peter the Great, and yet she could not even read. Her actual reign was short, but the fact that she reigned at all is remarkable considering her life and background. This is the story of Empress Catherine I, or Martha Skavronskaya. She was born Martha Helena Skavronskaya, most likely in Lithuania or what was then the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a vast region that encompassed much of Eastern Europe. Her father was either a grave digger or a farmer, but what is certain is that her heritage was entirely from the peasant classes, a fact the Romanov family would later try to brush under the rug by interfering with or outright banning investigations into her life, and inventing stories to make her origins seem more worthy of her position as empress. The exact date of her birth and even the year is disputed, but it is thought to be sometime around 1683 or 1684. Her parents tragically died of the plague in 1689, leaving her and her four siblings orphans, dependent on the kindness of relatives. One version of Martha's early life says that she went to live with an aunt, who sent her at age 12 to the town of Marienburg in Livonia, a region of the Swedish Empire and what is today in Latvia. Martha worked as a maid for the family of a Lutheran pastor called Johann Gluck, who was the first person to do a reliable translation of the Bible into Latvian. While in Marienburg, she got married to a Swedish cavalryman, and once again the stories differ about this match. In one version, the son of the Gluck family was beginning to take a fancy to the beautiful Martha, who was still very much an illiterate peasant in the eyes of his mother, who wished for a better match for her child than a scullery maid, and so Martha was promptly married off. In another account, she fell in love with the officer and they married quickly, as Russian troops were advancing towards the town in 1702, as the Great Northern War between Russia and Sweden raged on. Marienburg had remained peaceful, and the war had thus far passed them by, but days after Martha's marriage there was news of Russian troops gathering on the horizon, and the town was plunged into panic. Past the Gluck, with a Bible in his hands and going over the few phrases of Russian he knew, went to see them when they were close enough for discomfort, and apparently took the family along with him, including Martha. It turned out that the man in charge, Field Marshal Boris Sheremetev, spoke German and promised the pastor he would do what he could for his family, but the town would be captured by whatever means, such was the nature of war. Gluck offered his services as a translator, and Shremetev accepted, and eventually even took the pastor back with him to Moscow. Once again, this is only one version of the story. In another, Martha arrived in the Russian camp a prisoner of war, with only a blanket preserving her dignity, and was presented to another of the commanders, Rudolf Felix Bauer, as a prospective mistress. Whatever the case, she would not see her husband of eight days again. He may or may not have died, but Martha was now focused on making the best of her situation. She had a short affair with a Russian cavalryman, before being passed on to Boris Shremetev himself, and worked as his washerwoman, and possibly more. He took her back with him to Russia, and introduced or possibly even sold her to Alexander Menshikov, the so-called Prince from the Dirt, Peter the Great's best friend, who had himself risen from little more than a servant to prince and statesman. He was supposedly descended from palace servants, and may have even worked as a food vendor on the streets of Moscow, before being noticed by a favourite of Tsar Peter, Franz Lefort, taken under his wing and eventually after Lefort's death, succeeding him as Peter's new favourite. A lifelong alliance was built between Martha and Menshikov, who both saw they could use each other to get what they wanted, and always looked out for each other's best interests in the years to come. Martha in time wielded an influence over Peter that even the sly Menshikov did not possess, and likewise Martha was ever aware of her position in the world, which for many years remained precarious, and relied on Menshikov to use his power to help and guide her. When she first entered his household in 1703, once again as a washerwoman, she may have also been his mistress, but Menshikov quickly saw he could use this beautiful peasant to raise himself even further in the Tsar's esteem, and so when Peter visited one day to dine with his friend, Menshikov had Martha serve them. Peter noticed her beauty, and when he retired for the night, it was Martha who led him to his room, and possibly stayed there. 
When Peter visited Menshikov again, the latter was crafty enough to make sure Martha made no appearance, and waited for Peter to inquire after her, and he did so persistently, until on one visit Martha appeared, having changed her servant's attire for that of a finely dressed lady, complete with a fashionable hairstyle. Peter teased her about her new appearance, but was obviously attracted, and as Menshikov knew, the Tsar was looking for his next mistress. If Martha became Peter's official mistress, Menshikov would have more power over the Tsar through her, and could even use her as a spy if need be, but having a relationship with a man like Peter was no easy task. He was a towering six foot eight in height, an avid drinker prone to literal fits of temper, and his hatred once acquired could last quite some time. His previous mistress, the beautiful Anna Mons, had learned that lesson the hard way that very same year of 1703. After a 12-year relationship with Peter, Anna had been caught having an affair with the Prussian ambassador, which she had done in an effort to make Peter jealous and renew his ebbing passion for her. This backfired terribly, and when the ambassador proposed to Anna, he had her, her mother, sister, and 30 of her friends put under house arrest. Peter also took away gifts he had given her, and her estate near Moscow. Anna and the Prussian ambassador were only allowed to marry after nearly a decade in 1711. Peter was impulsive and hard to predict, and yet Martha understood him better than most, and managed his difficult nature. Not long after their second meeting, orders arrived for Martha to go to Moscow, and Menshikov sent her off with a bag of jewels. The journey to the capital was an uncomfortable one in a rickety carriage without any springs, but Martha was eager to see the city. I wonder if she was disappointed to discover she would be living in a modest house in the German Quarter, a pleasant suburb to the east of the city instead of the Kremlin, which Peter hated and avoided at all costs, because it was there as a child he had seen members of his family and friends slaughtered by Muscovite soldiers. As a result of this trauma, he preferred to stay away from Moscow altogether, but enjoyed staying in the more westernised neighbourhood on the outskirts, protected from the rest of the city's rife crime by deep ditches and a river. Not just Germans, but all kinds of Europeans found a home there, among the spacious houses and beautiful gardens, and Martha arrived at a smaller but well-equipped house belonging to Menshikov's sister Anna, and where his fiancée Daria was also staying with her own sister and aunt Anisia, who would become close friends with Martha. She was now treated as a lady and lived in her own unconventional world, quite different from the rest of the country where many women were kept in strict seclusion and still wore cumbersome traditional dress. Only the higher classes were beginning to adopt Western customs with any kind of enthusiasm. Tsar Peter loathed what he saw as his country's backward ways, and longed to modernise the place. But even for the energetic Peter the Great, change proved difficult and he faced opposition from the populace, who were highly superstitious and often on the edge of revolting against their modern ruler. These problems and the war meant Peter only occasionally found time to visit Martha, but nevertheless, in late 1704, she gave birth to a son. Mother and child were baptised in the Orthodox faith around the same time, and Martha took the name Catherine. She had been attending Orthodox church services at Peter's behest during her pregnancy, and her Russian was fast improving. She also dyed her hair black, to contrast her even more from the fair-haired Anna Mons. Another son soon followed, and the children strengthened Peter's affection for Catherine, but he was still kept away for long periods of time by the war, something which was often difficult for Catherine to bear. However, she was excellent at adapting to her surroundings, energetically and cheerfully getting on with things, qualities which were the main reason she and Peter were such a successful couple. She made herself agreeable to the Tsar in every way, and didn't try to play games like Anna Mons, nor did he see her as resentful and bitter like Yevdokia Lupukina, the wife Peter had sent to a nunnery. Peter and Catherine were also bonded by the deaths of almost all of their children, only two out of twelve of which survived to adulthood. Catherine was also very similar to Peter in many ways. She could drink men under the table, was fun-loving, undemanding, and knew how to mother him. In his letters, he referred to her as Matushka, mother, and when he went into such a fit of rage, even his closest friends would not dare to come near him, Catherine would put his head on her lap and gently soothe him until he calmed down. The positive effect she had on the Tsar was soon noticed, and so, when the war was going badly and a people's uprising seemed just around the corner in 1706, Peter was advised to take a holiday of sorts in his new capital of St. Petersburg, and Catherine went with him. Remarkably, the three-room log cabin where the pair lived like ordinary people still exists today. 
a gorgeous European city filled with art, culture, and amazing architecture has been built all around it. But then, what would one day be the glorious city of St. Petersburg was little more than a barren marshland, where many log cabins like Peter's had been erected for the only inhabitants of the region, the builders and soldiers who, unlike the Tsar, weren't having a fun time. Catherine planted flowers outside their little house and spent her days in peaceful domesticity while Peter worked in the shipyards and helped with the building going on all around them. The pair were closer than ever, they got a dog called Lisette, and often sent notes to each other pinned to its collar. They attended Menshikov's wedding in Kiev together, and when they got back, just in time for the autumn flooding, they found their house filled with two feet of water, which Peter found very funny, and Catherine was pregnant again. But this period of domestic bliss was the calm before the storm, as the two years that followed were some of the hardest for them both. In the winter, Peter returned to the war, and Catherine gave birth to a daughter named after her. But the following year, both of their sons died, the war was going badly, and rebellions rose up against Peter. In early 1708, Catherine gave birth to a second daughter, Anne, who would be one of the two children to survive to adulthood, and through her, the Romanov family would continue. The war was also going well enough at this point for Peter to take a holiday in St. Petersburg, and this time he brought along the rest of the Imperial family to see his ships. The royal family was an interesting collection of characters during this time. The stern Praskovia Soltokova, the widow of Peter's half-brother Ivan, with whom he had co-ruled until the latter's death, due to Ivan being mentally and physically disabled. Praskovia's three teenage daughters, the charming Catherine, the obstinate Anna, who would one day become Tsarina, and the sickly Praskovia, and Peter's playwright sister Natalia, with whom he was very close. Peter's son and heir Alexei was also there. He and his father did not get on. Peter thought Alexei was cowardly and incompetent, and Alexei, who was closer with his mother, no doubt resented his father for sending her to a nunnery, and for his harshness to both his wife and son in general. The family hated their excursions on the ships, which they had never been on before, but Catherine was spared the ordeal. Peter soon returned to the war, and their eldest daughter tragically died. This third loss hit Catherine especially hard, and to make matters worse, Peter was too busy to write to her for long periods of time, and so, after much pleading, Catherine was finally permitted to come and see him. When she did, she brought with her a request from the Tsarevich Alexei, who had become Catherine's godfather after her conversion to orthodoxy. Knowing the animosity between father and son, Catherine did a brave thing when she asked Peter to give Alexei a second chance, after he had failed to fortify Moscow to his father's liking. And thanks to Catherine's tact and charm, Peter assigned his son with the task of bringing supplies and reinforcements to the battlefield, and also visited him when he fell ill on the journey there. Catherine had earned both the love and trust of the Tsar, and was wife in all but name, a fact which must have played on her mind when Peter was in danger at the battlefront, as the security of her position depended entirely on him surviving. She had no official ties to power to fall back on in the event of his death, and her future was uncertain. She accompanied him on a tour, and then, in 1709, could relax for a while, as a massive victory was won over the Swedish. When Peter returned to the battlefront, Catherine stayed behind and gave birth to Elisabetta, who would eventually become Tsarina. Catherine's social position continued to improve. She was introduced to important officials and given the place of honour at the wedding of Peter's niece. Catherine's position was further solidified when her elder daughter Anne was made a princess in 1711. Not long afterwards, Peter called together the imperial family and stated that, although his first wife was still very much alive and he had neither divorced her nor actually married Catherine, she was his new wife and Tsarina, and they were to treat her as such. He assuaged their concerns by saying he would officially marry her the first chance he got, and the imperial family, who by this point were used to Peter's autocratic eccentricities, took it very well. He also said that in the event of his death, she was to be accorded the rank of imperial dowager. Then the unofficial newlyweds went on a visit to Poland, where balls were thrown in Catherine's honour and she was received with respect by everyone, but behind her back there were sneers and outrage at a peasant courtesan being treated as a royal. Catherine accompanied Peter and his army to the Turkish front, and on the way there they were attacked by the Turkish army, who outnumbered them considerably. Catherine and her ladies tended to the wounded, and the conflict was only resolved when Peter agreed to give the fort of Azov to the Ottoman Sultan. There is a legend that this was Catherine's idea, but it is unlikely to be true. When they returned to St. Petersburg, Peter made good on his promise, and on the 9th of February 1712 he married Catherine. 
their two small daughters, Anna and Elisabetta, acted as bridesmaids. The lavish wedding banquet was held at the newly built Winter Palace. The night ended with an impressive firework display, after much dancing, and Peter joked to the English ambassador, Charles Whitworth, that this marriage was certain to be fruitful because he had already had five children with his new wife. Despite Peter's frequent and long absences away from Catherine, over the next three years, two daughters and a son were born. In November of 1714, Catherine became the first recipient of the Order of St. Catherine, an award Peter had created in her honour after their wedding. This was the only imperial honour for women at the time. In the summer of 1715, Mary and Margaret, the couple's youngest children, died within weeks of each other. That winter, both Catherine and Charlotte, Tsarevich Alexei's wife, gave birth to sons, and both the infants were named Peter. Tsar Peter seemed much happier about the birth of another son by Catherine than he was about being a grandfather. The animosity between him and Alexei had only grown, and he had given Alexei an ultimatum, that if he did not prove himself fit to be Tsar, he should become a monk. Alexei chose to be a monk, but Peter gave him a year to decide, as this was not the outcome he had desired. If Alexei did abdicate his inheritance to the throne, the succession would be between two children, either Alexei's newborn son or Catherine's, and given the terrible fortune she and the Tsar had had with children, there was no guarantee this boy would survive to adulthood. It was also important that all this be decided as quickly as possible, as the Tsar's health was failing him, and in early 1716 he suffered his worst illness yet. Catherine's position would be precarious at best if he died, and her old allies were losing power. The Tsar had raged against Menshikov for embezzling millions, and had people close to him tortured, but thanks to Catherine, Menshikov got off with only giving back some of what he had stolen. Peter recovered his health, and in 1716 he and Catherine went to Denmark and Prussia, and were overjoyed by every update on their son that was sent from St. Petersburg. Their holidays came to an end when Tsarevich Alexei, unable to make a decision on remaining heir or becoming a monk, fled to Vienna. His wife Charlotte had died only a month after the birth of their son, but the Holy Roman Emperor, her brother, was willing to take Alexei in. Peter's son and heir, fleeing Russia, looked very bad internationally, and rumours of a plot to depose the Tsar spread fast. Peter, followed at a slower pace by a heavily pregnant Catherine, went to Amsterdam, and while on the journey she gave birth to a son who tragically died within a day. After briefly being reunited in Amsterdam, Catherine was forced to stay behind once more when Peter moved on to Paris, where the French court had refused to receive Catherine. Meanwhile, the Tsar's agents were busy trying to locate Alexei, and succeeded in late 1717, when the Tsar and Tsarina had returned to St. Petersburg. What happened next was truly shocking. Alexei was put on trial for a whole host of offences, including his traitorous fleeing of Russia and disobedience to the Tsar, and was granted mercy on the condition he give up his claim to the throne, recognise Catherine's son as heir, and reveal who his associates were. He eagerly agreed to all, and soon a wave of brutality swept through his entourage. His friends, servants, and even priests who had been allied with him were all tortured or sentenced to death. They had been forced to confess about Alexei's treachery, and their statements were enough to get the former heir re-arrested and sentenced to death. Not content with his son being executed, the Tsar wanted him to confess to even greater treachery, and so he had him tortured. And this was how Alexei died, aged 28, on the 26th of June, 1718. Catherine received news of a stable hand making grand claims of his connection to royalty, saying that he was her brother. He had been arrested for his insolence, but when Catherine met him, there was no denying he was indeed her brother Karl. Not long after, she was also reunited with her sister Christina. Catherine may have reinvented herself, but her siblings remained shabby figures, best kept out of sight. She provided for their needs and made sure they were looked after out of the view of the court, while she turned her attention to her daughter's marriages. Her daughters lived in the households of Menshikov and Peter's sister Natalia, and the elder Anne had grown into a beautiful and accomplished young girl. Despite speaking four languages, she was quite shy, while her younger sister Elisaveta was more outgoing. A marriage was planned between Anne and the charming Charles Frederick, Duke of Holstein Gottorp, who was eight years her senior. They had an awkward first meeting when Anne was 13, and were married in 1725 when she was 17. When this match was in the making, the prospects of the daughter of a commoner marrying into a prominent aristocratic family with close ties to royalty must have made Catherine feel even more secure. But by the time the pair actually married, she had ascended to the zenith point of power as Empress of Russia. 
While Anne could barely speak to her suitor, her mother and the Duke of Holstein hit it off very well. Catherine and Charles Frederick often danced together, an activity the Duke was accomplished at. He skillfully flattered Catherine and once even had musicians serenade her under her window. The Tsar took this very well and even liked the young man. Peter's main focus at this time was his victory at long last over the Swedish, after over two decades of war. The celebrations were gigantic, and courtiers who did not take part were fined. People literally danced and drank till they dropped, and after weeks of this, Catherine had to spend the winter resting as she had partied so hard she fell ill. That winter, the court went to Moscow, where Peter was not popular, but his son Alexei had been. Now the people were loyal to Alexei's son, and continued to resent Peter's reforms and him styling himself as emperor. The court entered Moscow on large sledges with model ships on top of them that carried Peter, Catherine and the rest of the court in a long procession. How strange and fantastical they must have looked to the ordinary Muscovites. The next spring, Peter took Catherine on his journey to the further regions of Russia, extending into Asia. Along the way, Catherine was able to meet and observe many different groups of people, each with their own culture and customs, and often with a local language or dialect. She was fascinated by the sights she saw and the foreign communities that existed in the remote regions of Russia. Progress was slow and stiflingly hot in the summer. Catherine was forced to cut off her hair and wear a cap to protect her head from the sun. Once the expedition reached Dagestan, by which point they had had their tents ripped apart by harsh winds, and many of their horses had died after grazing on poisonous plants, they narrowly avoided being attacked by mountain warriors. Catherine got to look down on the city of Durbant from the top of the battlements. In those days, when so few people travelled far, and even rulers were mostly confined to their courts, what an incredible experience this must have been for her. The journey back to Moscow proved more difficult and badly affected Peter's health. He took to his bed when they finally arrived home, but soon returned to energetically working, and was enraged by the corruption he saw all around him. Catherine alone was exempt from his fury, as he ordered executions, exiles, and even had Menshikov flogged. Peter became more dependent on Catherine, and amid this new wave of anger and punishment where nobody was safe, she was dragged into politics for the first time, as courtiers and officials begged her to intercede for them. During this last reign of terror in Peter's life, Catherine was kept busy trying to manage him. He had always been overconfident in his medical skills, which did much more harm than good in almost every case, and when the old Praskovia Soltakova fell ill, Catherine only narrowly persuaded Peter not to play doctor to the sick old woman. Praskovia died shortly after, a symbol of the old ways that were dying with her, and it was announced Catherine was to be crowned empress. Huge preparations for this lavish affair began, with shipments of cloth, jewels and food pouring in and no expense being spared. Competition among women for dressmakers and hairdressers was fierce, as everyone wanted to outdo one another for the unprecedented event. It was an exciting one for women especially. An ordinary woman rising to be the Tsar's wife was extraordinary enough, but to be crowned co-ruler, Empress Consort, was even more incredible. Only a short few decades ago, Tsarinas had been hidden away, with next to no political power. When the day finally came, Catherine was surrounded by splendour as she was led down the aisle of the Uspensky Cathedral on the arm of the Duke of Holstein. In the middle of the ceremony, just after Peter placed the crown on her head, she broke into tears of gratitude, grabbing Peter's hands and trying to kiss them. This loss of decorum irritated Peter and he stopped her from continuing her emotional display. When the long ceremonies were finally over, a huge banquet was held, and everywhere there was celebration. Pamphlets sung Catherine's praises until she almost seemed an angel, but behind the facade of acceptance, there were many who thought the whole thing outrageous and grumbled about the rise in taxes to pay for the event. While many women were inspired by Catherine's triumph, her coronation was a hollow symbol. In reality, she held no more power after than she had before it. She was empress in name only and still just the common mistress in the eyes of many. Soon there was a scandal that once again tested the security of Catherine's position. Willem Mons, the brother of the Tsar's ex-mistress Anna, had been appointed at Catherine's request to be the administrator of her estates and rose to become the chamberlain at the little court Peter had created for her. Mons was full of himself and took bribes from people who wanted to get close to Catherine, and in 1724 he was investigated and found guilty of embezzlement and subsequently beheaded. 
Peter had his head, which was said to be exceptionally handsome, preserved in a jar, and the story goes that Peter made Catherine keep it by her bedside, though this is probably not true. Apparently, it was only in the reign of Catherine the Great that the head was finally buried, when the Empress found it among a collection of oddities. It had remained perfectly intact for decades, looking just the same as on the day of execution. Rumours at court said that Willem, who was a charming flatterer and liked to write romantic verses, had actually been Catherine's lover. Some of his letters that circulated at court were said to be for her, but it seems more likely he was in love with one of her daughters, or a member of her entourage. It is possible that Catherine had an affair with him, but after two and a half decades of observing Peter the Great's temper, it would have been an incredibly stupid risk to be disloyal. Whatever the truth, the rumours reached Peter's ears and definitely played a part in Willem's downfall. His other sister, Matriona, was flogged, sent to Siberia, and her sons were forced into the army, and Catherine was not exempt from her husband's wrath this time. He was cold towards her, even angry as he had never been before. He turned a deaf ear to her pleas for mercy towards Willem, and put her through a gruesome test of loyalty. The day after the execution, Peter took Catherine to look at Willem's body, but she showed little emotion. There is an account where Peter smashed either a vase or a mirror in front of her and screamed, I made you and I can unmake you as easily as this. And Catherine calmly replied, Do you think that will make the palace more beautiful? Eventually the couple were reconciled, but then Peter's ill health, which had been slowly weakening him for years, made him bedridden with gangrene. He died without a will on the 28th of January, 1725. Catherine's position was once again precarious and vulnerable. Menshikov promised to do whatever he could for her, as she had so often done for him. Everyone argued over who should be Peter's successor, and all the options were less than ideal. Catherine had been crowned empress, but was not a Romanov and couldn't even read. Tsarevich Alexei's son Peter was a more legitimate option, but he was only eight, and there would have to be a lengthy regency which complicated things even more, and those who had been involved in Tsarevich Alexei's death were worried for their own lives if his son took the throne. There was Anne, Peter's eldest surviving child with Catherine, but many argued she was illegitimate. Finally, the matter was settled while all the officials debated. Menshikov, seeing that a civil war was a possibility if the successor was not decided quickly, had mobilised Catherine's supporters at once, and given cash incentives to those on the fence. The Winter Palace was surrounded by the army in favour of Catherine, and she had no idea it had even happened. As the ministers continued to argue over the validity of her claim to the throne, she tearfully entered the room and began begging them to protect her and her daughters. Her pleas were interrupted by the Grand Admiral Praxin getting on his knees and proclaiming, Long live our beloved Empress. Just as her coronation as Empress Consort had been a symbolic affair, in her own rule as the first Empress Regnant of Russia, she let others make most of the important decisions. She, or rather Menshikov, had the army, and that was all that ultimately mattered. Everyone swore allegiance to her in the days that followed Peter's death, while she walked about in a daze of grief, visiting the rooms they had shared and looking at his paintings, all sitting by his embalmed body, laid out for the court to pay their final respects. Her sole focus was on the funeral and memorial of her husband, and the only thing needed from her in government meetings was her signature on documents, which her secretary guided her hand to make as she was unable to even write her own name. As the initial raw grief of a Peter began to subside, Catherine's youngest daughter Natalia died, and her coffin lay next to her father's until they were buried in the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul on the 8th of March, 1725. Catherine concerned herself mainly with domestic affairs, event planning, and special ceremonies. She was kind to Peter Alexievich, Peter the Great's orphan grandson, who was presumed to be Catherine's heir. Her ministers were eternally at each other's throats, and she was often unwillingly dragged into their politics, despite being quite content to be a figurehead without any real power, as long as she and her family were safe. She brought her siblings out of hiding and found her other three sisters, whom she invited to St. Petersburg along with their husbands and collective nine children. They were given Russian lessons and taught etiquette, before being granted estates, noble titles and positions at court. Eventually, all Catherine's nieces and nephews made advantageous marriages as well. A privy council was created, but Catherine had little to do with it, and many of the things Peter had put so much effort and passion into began to rot away, including his once glorious navy. Catherine became increasingly vain, adoring public events where she was applauded. 
She loved going to balls and banquets, dancing, eating and drinking until the early hours of the morning, clad in fine clothes and jewels. She didn't like to be disturbed by her squabbling government and let go of any semblance of discipline in her life. She would often go to bed early in the evening and have breakfast at three o'clock the next morning. She had no routine or consistent sleep schedule, and this, mixed with all the hard partying, took its toll on her health. Without the impressive personality of Peter, a true autocrat, to guide her, she was a listless being, entertaining at all hours of the day and night, abandoning her duties as ruler and increasingly taking comfort in alcohol. Despite her position at the zenith point of power, it seems this last period of Catherine's life was one she was unable to cope with. The best times were in the past, and she was a woman who had been through many sorrows. She had been ripped away from all she knew 27 years ago, and had since devoted her life to managing Peter, existing to be his comfort. The loss of ten children and years of being in a vulnerable position had clearly taken their toll. People who saw her again as empress after years away from court said she looked quite different, old, tired and bloated. She was prematurely aged in her early to mid-forties when she died, on the 6th of May, 1727. Catherine lived an incredible life, and was a generous and simple woman. She is one of those rare figures in history that is fascinating because they remain so ordinary even when faced with extraordinary circumstances. She is relatable in the fact that she did the best she could to survive. She was no sly schemer, keeping the same friends and allies for years, and not risking making enemies when she could avoid it. She was devoted to Peter and was a normal person, with little aspirations for social climbing beyond securing the safety of herself and her family. She was not a great personality like her husband, but it was her simplicity that made her so attractive to him. He was her sole focus, and when he died, in her understandable shock and grief, she did not know how to adjust and sought escapism. This has been a wonderful video to make and I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like and subscribe for more like this, and comment any video ideas you'd like to see below. Dos vidanya, until next time.